Hi, everyone. Um, uh, as he said, I'm Sean Lopez, and uh, I'm going to give a talk about GNOME and the web and how to use the web technologies in the GNOME platform. Uh, I actually think this was a better title, so you know, you can imagine this was the actual title. Um, I'm a GNOME hacker since like 10 years ago or something like that. I started using GNOME for university and I've been developing on and off. These days I maintain the Epiphany web browser and I also the WebKit GTK rendering engine which is used by Epiphany and other GNOME modules. I work for Egalia which is a consultancy company. We do stuff around GNOME and other open source technologies and as I said I'm going to go briefly it's a pretty short talk about all the ways about how, how, how would you use the web technologies in the GNOME platform. So I'm going to start from the very beginning and the very beginning is uh, LibSoup. Um, I was actually asking Bastin before where these LibSoup names come from because there's a few modules in GNOME that have like weird food names like LibEgg and LibBacon but it turns out that it's actually not related to food at all. It's a joke on the SOAP XML RPC thing that nobody uses anymore so that's where it comes from and I learned it like 10 minutes ago so now you know. So as I said it's a uh, it's an HTTP library that allows you to, to basically do HTTP requests and uh, and responses and all that. It's actually a pretty old module. Uh, the first commit, as you can see, was done in 2000, so it's like over 10 years old. Uh, and this Alex, the name is completely broken. I think it was probably because the import from CVS to Git by it's Alexander Larson, if I'm not wrong. Um, the same then, HTTP has a basically a client-server architecture, so you can act as a HTTP client or the server or, or both in your program if you need to. And the basic way of working is doing requests and getting responses from the server. Same then, HTTP. So it supports all the usual HTTP methods like get, post, put, delete, etc. Uh, and it has a few like advanced uh, or advanced features like it supports HTTP cookies. Uh, we actually implemented this not so long ago. So even being a pretty old module, nobody ever felt they needed cookies for the things they were using LibSoup for. So we did this actually for the Epiphany web browser when we switched to WebKit and LibSoup. And this was probably like two years ago or something. And this was the first time I actually got cookies working. So. And, uh, and for cookies, uh, there's a, like a soup library called LibSoup GNOME, which gives you like... Um, the basic storage system is text cookies, but if you use LibSoup now, you can, guess, uh, you can get the SQLite backend, which is compatible with the Mozilla format. So it's pretty convenient if you are importing your cookies from Firefox, which is what we were doing. Um, it also supports HTTP proxy. And if, again, you use LibSoup GNOME, it will automatically get your settings from uh, gsettings or gconf or wherever and just automatically work out of the box. And it's how our browser works. Uh, it also supports HTTP authentication, and again, if you use LibSoup GNOME, it will automatically go to your key ring thing and do all the magic stuff, so things just, just work. Uh, it supports content encoding, multi-part. We recently implemented an HTTP cache, which was something we needed in the browser, and many people using LibSoup for different applications, like some guy was doing a map, a map GMAPS-like application he was like downloading tons and tons of data from the map, the tiles from the map, the map and he had to make a, his own cache because he was just downloading so much data. So now we have a, a cache built in in LibSoup and you can use it if you want. Um, as I said, it also supports a server mode. So if you need uh, to have a local HTTP server for whatever reason, you can do it. But I don't think it's very useful for us, so I won't talk much about that. So basically, the, the point of this is if your web services you're interacting with support some kind of HTTP API, you can just use LibSoup and do an application just using that. And the common example that pretty much everyone does is like a Twitter client or something for GNOME. Or, um, but the thing is, most websites support some kind of RESTful uh, interface. And if you don't know what this is, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to, to go much into detail, but it's basically some kind of a standard way of representing resources through URIs and you can do requests for them and they have like a standard representation for them. And so the idea is that, you know, there's some basic uh, verbs and things of work, ways of working that all sites should support. And um, the thing is, 
most sites uh, respect this to some extent. I think almost no one does it like really the way it's supposed to work, right? It's like pretty close. So, you know, some people figure, well, instead of using just libsub, we should make a library to work with REST like, like sites. So it's called LibREST. It was developed, I think, by Intel for their mobling system. Uh, and the basic thing it gives you is a proxy object for a URL where you can tell it like the basic structure of the, of the resource through the URL and it gives you like a, a much easier way that this is the name of the object and it gives you a much easier way of making requests to the page and also handling the results you get because uh, when this was done I think it was like a few years ago the usual way of doing this was through XML and it's a pain in the ass to get the results from the you know parts and so they, they have like some basic support to help you uh, handling the, the XML responses. But these days, JSON is common, so I think if you just, if you just get JSON requests, it's much easier. There's, there's another library in, in GNOME called JSON glib, so you, you, know, you know, you just get the string as a JSON thing and give it to JSON glib, and in two lines, you already get like your response. Um, okay, so that's lib rest. And uh, so, you know, you, we keep going higher in the stack, and some people figure, well, you know, most people use the same, like, five sites, so why should I implement the same thing, like, the same Twitter, REST, API thing using LibREST over and over again? So, s I think the same people said, let's just do a library that supports the main sites everyone wants to use, and it's called LibSocialWeb. And if you can see the pattern here is that all problems in computer science can be solved, adding just another layer of indirection in your stack. So the thing that uh, Lib Social Web gives you is a DBAS API to basically uh, ask for the services available for in your you know environment or system or wherever. Uh, it, it, it's dynamic, so, uh, dynamic, so you can add more and you know the, the things change. You can query for the services or capabilities that each each site supports. You know, Twitter is not exactly the same as YouTube, but there's sort of a superset of APIs that all of them could support. And this kind of thing is used, it's going to be used in, three, in GNOME 3.2 in something called GNOME Contacts. So if you can see there, they, they will have some support for Twitter or Identica or, you know, wherever. And they actually use an even higher level uh, library thing, which is called LibFolks. So it, it also integrates with the tele telepathy framework to do instant messaging and that kind of thing. But this is one example of, of where this kind of thing is used. Um, okay, so that's for the like low-level basic things that about the web uh, platform in GNOME, and then there's WebKit, which, as I said, uh, I w I've been working on for a few years, and this is sort of like the nuclear option of the web thing. So you know, it's like if you need, whatever you need, if you cannot do it with WebKit, you can probably not do it at all. So it's like it's the final solution for any problem. Uh, it supports, as everyone knows, like you know, HTML and the new all the new HTML sub pro uh, standards that people are working on, CSS, including CSS3, animations, JavaScript, uh, the main engine that we ship is uh, JavaScript Core, which is developed by Apple, among other people, but you can also use V8, which is the one used by Google, so, you know, like, you can switch back and forth. And um, for GNOME, with our port is called WebKit GTK, it's in the upstream repository, and we, you, we make uh, releases in synchrony with the GNOME release schedule. Uh, we have been working on it uh, actively since 2008, so it's like it's actively maintained to this day so far. Um, our last release was, was 1.4 for GNOME 3.0, and the next one will be 1.6 for 3.2. And the, the basic thing we provide is basically a GTK widget, which is, has a WebKit web view inside, and you can embed it in your uh, application to show any kind of web content at all. So the main case uh, that drives the development of WebKit GTK and the, is the browser we maintain, which is Epiphany, so you can see showing you know, a normal web page, but it's also used for f f uh, by other GNOME applications. For instance, the Empathy Instant Messaging client uses uh, WebView to render like the conversation uh, windows, and it's compatible because, and they, they can be themed with HTML, CSS, and it's compatible with the Mac OS X client, which is called Audium, I think. So you can just get the, the Audium themes, install them in Empathy, and they just work out of the box. Uh, there's a, um, okay, so now uh, here, I'm going to show quickly if this works at all. Um, other ways, that we are integrating WebKit technologies in the GNOME platform. Um, this place. Wow, shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well, uh, so the, I showed this demo in Wadec, and it's basically trying to integrate web applications in the desktop. So if you go to the Angry Birds web page, which is an HTML5 version of Angry Birds, Yeah, so, okay, here it is. So it's the Angry Birds thing, and, um, well, you can actually play even, I think. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, okay. <laughs> So here you see um, there's a new menu entry in Epiphany which is called Save as Web Application. So when you click it, you get uh, this icon which is provided by the web page itself. Uh, it's something that was started by Apple for their iPad and iPhone. So it's basically just a tag called link, uh, and then it's Apple Touch icon. They provide an, an icon for the web page to be saved as a web application for the platform. They can provide like different sizes. There's some metadata for the effect they want to apply in the, you know, in the icon itself. And then there's a title here, which is the default title for the page. You can change whatever you want. So you know, we can put GNOME there. And if you click here, I'm not going to do it now because it's not going to work. But if you click there, it will do some sort of animation and create a launcher for it in the shell. But we can go there now and see it created. So it's here. Uh, it's lo it looks lo just like a normal application. And if you click it, uh, it should launch something. <laughs> okay, it didn't work. Whatever. Yeah. So it should launch a new Epiphany instance which without Chrome, any Chrome, so it, it wouldn't have any UI at all. Uh, why is this not working? Okay, I don't know why it's not working. Yeah, anyway, it never works. I don't know, I, it didn't work in the WADEC either, so it, whatever. So yeah, it will, show, it will launch an Epiphany instance without UI, and it's a different process. So if you crash your web application for whatever reason, you won't crash you know, your other normal web browsing instances. And it's also sandbox, so if you try to go to another domain that is not the domain of your web application, it will launch a normal browser page. So, you know, for uh, things like games or maybe Gmail or Twitter that it's, you are using a lot and you're using them constantly, you might want to just save them as web applications in your shell launcher and just click it and use it as a different instance than your other, like, random web things. So this will be available in... Uh, in a 3.2, I'm going to commit it real soon. And now let me undo this thing. So that's one way of using Epiphany, which is basically to show already, ma uh, sorry, WebKGTK, which is basically to show already made web content in your application in some way. The other way of using it is uh, the famous or infamous DOM APIs that everybody knows from the web. You can actually access them from native GNOME uh, APIs now, which is through something called the object DOM bindings, which is basically a mapping from the standard DOM APIs to something which looks like a G object, a normal G object API. In fact, this is basically how the JavaScript thing that is in every browser works, because the standard DOM APIs are defined uh, using something that is not tied to any language in particular, so people just have to map it 
to the language that they want to support, and it, it's called something. It's something called a binding. So we provide a geobjet binding for DOM APIs. Uh, the default implementation is a geobjet and C, so you can just use it with that. But um, we provide geobjet introspection annotations for all the APIs. So this basically means if you use the new geobjet introspection framework, it should work in any language that it's supported. I know that people are using it already in Python and in JavaScript. And um, one thing that might interest you is a project called SITKIT. Um, this is the, the URL for the project. And it's basically a project to provide uh, a GNOME native development platform using both the GNOME platform libraries, like GTK or GLIP or whatever, and the WebKit uh, technologies like HTML, JavaScript, CSS. So the, the basic idea is that you do all the UI using HTML or CSS, and then if you want to interact with the rest of the platform, you use the normal libraries, and it's all integrated and unified in one single environment. Um, okay, so that was almost everything, but there's two bonus things. One is uh, JavaScript, it's a quite popular language these days. I'm sure all of you know it. Uh, it's not like completely tied to the web, but the web is where it's like overwhelmingly used. So, you know, people associate JavaScript on the web quite a lot. So one thing we are doing in GNOME now is using JavaScript for actual uh, application development inside, the, inside our platform. The main way we use it is through something called GJS, which is basically uh, a G-object wrapper on top of the JavaScript. The JavaScript this uses is the spider monkey from the Firefox or Mozilla. And there's other projects. One is called Seed, which is the same thing but on top of JavaScript core. And I think some people are doing the same thing for V8, but I actually don't know what's the status of that. And one thing you might not know is that GNOME Shell, which is what I'm using and you saw sort of working before, this thing, it's actually written completely in JavaScript. So the hackers just write everything in JavaScript. They interact with all the GNOME platform libraries through the bindings, through the object introspection thing I have mentioned. And it makes it really easy to you know, quickly iterate the designs and also, it makes it really easy to make some extensions and demos. So I'm going to show another demo if I manage to make it work, which I might not. Uh, so I don't know if anybody knows the thing I just showed. Uh, what's this? But OK, so maybe someone will get the joke, actually. <laughs> So if you, if you, yeah, you can see, okay. So there's this directory called local shell, GNOME shell extensions, where you can dump your shell extension. Okay. And I think for GNOME 3.2, we are going to have a much better way of doing these things, but for now, this is pretty much how it works. Okay. Uh, I think I need to, yeah. So yeah, um, if you, the, 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 this extension I made is basically, the, the story is that my laptop is buggy and overheats, but I, I wouldn't realize it was overheating until it was too late and it was like shutting down because of, you know, too much heat. So I figure I should make some kind of really obvious thing when the temperature is going you know, through the roof so I can, you know, do something about it. And if you have watched Evangelion when they are in travels, shit, they get these like fancy animations about things getting going wrong. So I said, hey, I should do the same thing. So <laughs> this is the animation that should happen when, you know, your laptop is overheating. And what I did is just, if you click the top menu bar thing, it, it shows that. Um, and I can quickly show you uh, a bit how it's done. And as I told you, it's um, it's really all JavaScript, like the normal JavaScript in the web. And here you can see how you import some basic modules to the introspection framework. And um, you know, there's some methods to draw an ex uh, this hexagon thing from Evangelion. Like you know, I spend like 99% of the time figuring the math to do this crap. 
especially the how to put all the hexagons in the you know in the space. And uh, but one interesting thing out of this is that it uses the same uh, the same libraries that you use in the web to do animations. So some of you might be familiar with this thing called Twinner, which is basically the framework Flash and Adobe uses for animations. So we ported this from Flash to JavaScript like a few years ago, and now you can, it's how the shell does all its animations, and you can use it yourself for any program you want and all your extensions. So you can like define, you know, what happens, uh, like moving actors through curves, and you can set like the, the, the kind of animation it does and how much time does it take. Here you can see how you can set some parameters. So, you know, it's like change the opacity from zero to wherever in zero to 25, and when it's completed, do whatever, this kind of thing. And, you know, our, our idea behind this was, well, all designers already know how to use Twinner and they're really used to it. So, you know, we should provide exactly the same technologies that are used in the web for the non-development. And, you know, here you can see how it's used. Uh, I'm showing two of them. Okay. Okay, so that was the first bonus. The second one is. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The second one is uh, for GTK 3.0, uh, we did a lot of. Uh, clean up in the backend story in GTK. So, you know, it, now it's much easier to have multiple backends and it's much easier to develop new backends. Uh, still, the main backend is still like the X, X11 one for Linux, but, you know, it should make it easier to maintain the Windows and OS 10 backends or, you know, the frame buffer, frame buffer one if someone wants to do it. But some interesting thing that uh, happened as a result of this is that Alexander Larson, the same guy that made this commit in 2000 for Libsoup, made a new backend called Broadway. And if you know, if you just Google like GTK Broadway, you can go to his blog and read all about it. But the basic idea is that it's an HTML5 backend for GTK. And what does this mean? This means that when you launch it with an application, it creates a local web server, like a, a service, and it exports the the application, the GTK application you are supposed to be running through that server in a Canvas object that you can load. And it sends all the data through HTML, XML, HTTP requests to your browser, and it it detects when you're clicking on things and, you know, through the DOM events and sends the data back to the server through a WebSocket. So the idea is basically that you can be running a bunch of GTK applications in a server and people can access them through a web browser from anywhere in the planet or, you know, do it locally if you want. And Seriously? I was going to show you how it works. Yeah. Okay, it's actually crashing now. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Oof. I'm short of time. I guess I can. So okay. the video is a bit long, but. Uh, So as you can see, he's accessing the a local web server. And this is a GTK demo application that is shipped with GTK, and it's opening it inside the browser.
Yeah, so as I said, what he does is detect the DOM events and send them through WebSocket to the server, and the server knows how to translate from the DOM events to the GTK events and back and forth. I, yeah. Okay, and since we are a bit short on time, I think I can just finish here. Uh, okay. So if somebody has questions, I think we have a couple of minutes for. Uh, so with the transitions from WebKit to WebKit 2, would WebKit GTK manage to support the same public API? The same public API? Yes. Uh, than what? Than WebKit 2? Yes. Okay, so you mean the C API, cross-platform API? Yes. Right, so our plan these days is f we are still going to provide a G-object, you know, native GNOME API for everyone to use on top of WebKit 2 because that's what people need and expect. But we are also going to give access to the C API because it's cross-platform and you know it's useful for some kind of tasks. But the thing is that it's still on, uh, in development, and the, you know the people driving WebKit two are not yet quite sure of how it's going to end up being, or they are even thinking of moving from C to C plus plus. So you know it's like still very much in development. So they are asking everyone that if they ship it, that they not tell anybody it's stable. So you know you can use it, but. For now, you're, it's still, you know, it might change completely and you, just, you have to keep the pieces when it breaks. So, but yeah, the plan is to, to give access to it and hopefully someday it will be stable and, you know, all the ports will share this core or basic C or C++ API. Thank you. I actually have another question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I just wrote an application in where I wrote the UI part inside, basically inside WebKit GTK. And I often want to make function calls to my native C code. So I just, I actually hack it with an RPC solution. So right, it's, so. It's gonna, what's the, what's the right is, way to uh, do it? The thing I mentioned about the, the DOM bind is, is basically you have a G object based API where you can interact directly with the web content from that C API. But so what if my JavaScript wants to call my C code? Oh, you mean your JavaScript? Right, okay. so is there anything like Mozilla's JSC types or? The idea here will be that. Well, depending on your plugin, it might be easier for you to not use JavaScript. But if you are using JavaScript, you can still use uh, the JavaScript core C API library. I, I don't know if you know about it. And with that, you can inject some code in your JavaScript environment or context that will call GNOME where some event happens. So that's one way of doing it. But yeah, if, if, if I, I might recommend using the object on bindings if you can, because it makes much, much easier to interact with you know, C and GNOME APIs from your web page. But I mean, we can talk later about this here probably and see what's better to do here. So, well, my idea on this is hopefully that's not the way to do it in the future, but right now it's the only way to do it because there's basically no alternative. But I'm hoping Apple or you guys or, you know, everyone will figure some kind of standard for web app, you know, the icons, how to download the apps, how to make them work offline, and, you know, we will be able to use that in the future. But for now, this is basically the only thing web apps are providing, if they provide anything at all, which, as you said, in most cases, they don't. If you identify as the iPhone, actually, so some pages will give you the icon only if you identify as the iPhone, which is, makes it even worse. But 
when there's no icon at all, we use a screenshot of the face. Like we, we try to get like the logo or whatever, and you know, we show it as the icon. So hopefully you can recognize the thing in your launcher. But yeah, right now it's really early, early stages of this whole thing. But hopefully it will get better. Uh, I didn't do it. I, it's, uh, as I said, it's Alexander Larson, but I think it, he used oh, compressed PNG, like he divides the UI in chunks and then sends oh, as PNGs through the web socket. Yeah, so as da data URIs, I think. So it's just a, you know. <sighs> what do you mean normal? Like. <laughs> <laughs> Right, no, 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 no. I think it's completely ad hoc thing he invented, yeah. Okay, I guess they can talk, and yeah, I don't know. Oh, very sorry, uh, I'm very sorry. As a host, uh, I need to control the time. So if you have any question, or you want to uh, talk to Sean, uh, please, uh, after the session. Uh, I'm very uh, sorry to terminate your talk or uh, uh, other Mm, speak uh, our questions. So uh, let's applause to Sean and uh, invite the best team. Okay.